Hello, everyone, and happy Arbor Day. Um, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Piper, and I'm an intern um, with the Canal Forest Restoration Project at the Rice Creek Field Station at SUNY Oswego. And my co-presenter is Kristen Haynes. Um, she's the assistant director of the field station and is also like kind of leading the leading supervisor for the Canal Forest Project. Um, so now I will be handing it off to Daria Warner and John Santomieri. I may have pronounced that wrong. Okay. <laughs> um, and they will be presenting on their bio art projects. Um, they're both from University at Buffalo, um, the bio art department. Um, thank you, Piper. So uh, my name is Daria Warner. I want to say thank you for inviting me and John to participate in the conference. So I'm just going to share my screen and start my presentation right away. And, and just let me know if you're like able, hold on a second, to see this. Yes, right? Okay, great. So let me just minimize this part just did this and I'm going to present. Okay, so my, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Daria Warner. I graduated from University at Buffalo in um, 2020, which is last year. And I work in intersection of climate change by field hypothesis, sustainable art practices, systems of intelligence and interspecies communications. And um, my work, um, the work that I'm going to disc discuss today is actually the projects that I've been working for about three to four years. And before I go into the details of the project, I wanna give a little bit of theoretical background. Um, and so the hybrid matter, radical care and sustainable art practices project is, is a hybrid matter, is a series of travel and site specific temporal sculptures that address local sites, their history and ecology. The project initiates a dialogue on sustainable art practices and the collaborative possibility of art and science. It is executed by using an open source custom made 3D bioprinter. I call it the microprinter. So the project um, based on uh, several theoretical backgrounds, one of them is biophilia hypothesis, is the idea that human possess an ultimate connection to seek uh, with nature and other forms of life. And it was used by uh, German born psychoanalyst, Eric Fromm uh, in 1973, and then described as a passionate love of life and all that is alive. And then it was used later by American biologist, Edward Wilson and his work Biophilia. And that's how it got so much traction uh, around scholars and beyond, which proposed the tendency of humans to focus on and to affiliate with nature and other life forms as in part, part in, in genetic basis. It's in our genes to actually feel this connection. So, but one of the interesting things as an artist working with living organisms, I always have these ideas and also questions about what is living versus non-living. Uh, why do we only need to care about the living matter? And what is what is happen if we start caring about the non-living matter? And Jane Bennett is a theorist who actually was is an advocate for vitality of all matter. And her ideas in Vibrant Matter book was about how we can develop connections with everything around us, including, for example, electric electricity and uh, magnetic field, and uh, something that is non-living or partially living like trash. And so she proposes very interesting and radical ideas about a care for all the matter. And because in her hunch is that the image of the dead or thoroughly quote instruments the life matter feeds human hubris and our earth destroying fantasies of conquest and consumption. So she wants to promote greener forms of human culture and more attentive encounters between people materialities and thing materialities. So reading her book, I uh, while I was reading her book and researching this subject, I sort of um, was really fascinated by these ideas of care for non-living versus living. And um, I built uh, with the, so the idea of the hybrid matter was born in the project, which is actually facilitated by uh, the custom built uh, 3D bioprinter. And the bio, it's 
called the microprinter and it's an open source 3D bioprinter that prints mycelium substrate ready for inoculation with various types of fungi. And this combines additive manufacturing with biological tissue or create a living sculpture or design. It aims to bring together engineering, biological sciences and art under the umbrella of open citizen science. And it was developed over the course of three years of research conducted in three different institutions. And the primary drive of this was um, uh, the overflow of toxic and non-recycled materials from industries, that for, but not just every other industry, but also in art. As an artist graduating um, from two institutions, I noticed the amount of trash and that's left behind after each semester and beyond. And so this promote this idea of uh, 3D printing with living matter and also the idea of sustainable art practices. So the microprinter is based on working with mycelium and beyond, but I just want to focus a little bit on mycelium and probably majority of people already know what mycelium is because of Paul Stamets and all the information. And now we have my mycelium leather that's been developed by Microworks, which is super cool. It could actually go into fashion industry by big fashion brands who will adapt this. And the mycelium is an underground part of the mushroom. It's a vast network of threads that spread through various substrates. It could be soil, decayed matter, wood. And it has a unique ability to take over the shape of the substrate. And thus, it's making an ideal candidate for bioprinting and sculpting as well. So the mushroom cycle is pretty self-explanatory. We all see mushrooms in the woods. They drop spores. The spores germinate. They create hypha. Hypha meet another hypha. And they mate and they become um, a one mycelium and then they produce mushrooms and the cycle completes. So uh, microprinter also has broader intended applications besides printing with mycelium. It is designed and I'm working on the third prototype to print beyond fungi, to be versatile and mobile, to be inexpensive and easily assembled under limited access to materials. It's a traveling part of the artwork and it also becomes a major contributor to hybrid matter, the series of site-specific temporal sculptures. So um, the applications of the microprinter are, are art as a living sculpture, a design as a production and growth of custom made biodegradable products or packaging in combination with 3D scanning app in agriculture, the production of growth of custom made planters inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi to promote better growth and yield of starter cultures and education to uh, introduce and engage local communities via sustainable art practices, workshops and demos and talks and field trips. And of course, interdisciplinary collaborations. So the workflow of the printer, it's the first phase we collect the local fungi species and or obtaining commercial strains for specific project purposes. Then we create a substrate from locally sourced ingredients to minimize carbon footprint specific to each location microprinter travels to. Then the 3D printing of desired sculptures uh, starts. And then after it's done, we inoculate with fungi or whatever the organism is present um, in the substrate. And then the growth happens and then the harvest of the final sculpture. So the little schematics right here, it's kind of like shows, which I drew when I was working on the project, it basically shows um, there's different recipes you can potentially create, then you can either sterilize them in the pressure cooker or autoclave. You don't actually have to sterilize your substrate, which is my hybrid meta project is not using anything sterilized. And then you can load the substrate to the printer and 3D print your sculpture, or you can grow mycelium separately and then load it into the 3D printer. But eventually you grow your sculpture in the incubator um, and then you basically can exhibit it. But the idea is uh, a temporality of the artwork, the artwork that degrades back into nature, the artwork that is not permanent. And I want to bring this attention because uh, of the so much that, that how we are so fixated on things being permanent and constantly being encased that ephemerality and fluidity of my work is really, I think, um, creates this connection between me and nature within non-living or living things because everything changes. But I also wanna make sure that my uh, work does the minimal impact on the environment. So the background and the influences of the, again, it was ignited by the overflow of uh, the trash and the pollution and all the harm. So the first prototype was built at Korch International Artists Association, part of an art and science residency in New Delhi. 
the second prototype was built uh, at University at Buffalo as a part of my MFA thesis. And I'm right now working on my own prototype. The first two are based on open source. So they were adapted, recalibrated and redone, but eventually they are, it's based on the very common printing sources. So microprinter, the first prototype was basically the idea came up after I was introduced to the mycelium workshop when I was an undergrad at School of Visual Arts. And, and again, as I mentioned, mycelium has this unique ability to take over the shape of the substrate. Uh, to do the sculpture, uh, you have to use the mold, right? So, and unfortunately for mycelium, the best, uh, product, the best material is plastic, which is non-porous. Uh, so what happened is it was a dissonance, a huge disconnect in my brain between the fact that we have this on one side, this organism that has an amazing ability of degrade, bioremediate, and also decompose and, uh, you know, a toxic matter. And basically they are contributors to all the matter, a lot of the matter that we are among other organisms that we are present right now. And I'm using plastic that will not degrade for hundreds of years. So this is how the idea of 3D printing with uh, mycelium was born. And when we were in New Delhi, we used this custom syringe pump that was developed by our third collaborator to insert it into the Tiva Tarantula 3D printer that we used to deconstruct. And while I was there in New Delhi, I was thinking, how can I connect my project to the local culture? And a lot of our ideas and talks was in the kitchen and India has a huge tradition of, um, you know, cooking at home and serving at home, the same as Russia and I'm Russian. So we really connected with a, a local community like that. And I thought I was introduced to all this food. So I thought, well, I like this food a lot and I'm trying all this food. Why not like mycelium to try this food as well? So I created all these different substrates uh, from the food that we were used as uh, spices, like here you have red pepper and rice flour, coconut fiber, coffee grounds, turmeric, there's chutney, and there's other substrates I don't can even remember at this point. Interesting enough, chutney did not really, mycelium did not chutney because there was a lot of salt in it, but it really responded well to the pepper and the flour. Turmeric was also hard for it to digest because a turmeric is actually well known to have anti-inflammatory and anti-fungal properties. So the second prototype was built at University of Buffalo. And uh, this is where the idea of the hybrid matter had evolved. And I um, basically wanted to show this project at Buffalo China factory to address the first local site. It's a huge factory that's been operational for about a hundred years. It was shut down several years ago. And I had obtained um, on the last sale, I obtained some cups from the Buffalo China factory and I 3D scanned them and exported them to be 3D printed. Then my custom built printer print uh, with a custom substrate that I made from the bisque clay from the factory, from the coffee grounds, from the local shops and from the uh, cardboard from the delivery boxes. So then the, print, the cups were printed, seeded with mycelium and it responded really well. It overtook and about 30 days, it fully colonized and produced fruiting bodies, as you can see right here on the left. So this little pins all over, they are actually my mushrooms that are about to grow. And so this was an interesting uh, development because my idea of the hybrid matter was to exhibit the project in Buffalo China factory in the pedestals. And unfortunately it's been postponed because of COVID where in the final stage, the mycelium will start degrade and deform this, the cups and they will produce the spores. And this is where I'm thinking about how do you create a hybrid matter with the factory itself? The factory is not operational. It has a very dark a human environment. So I thought like if mycelium will produce in the spores, the spores will be uh, overtaken with the flow to the, um, within the building and then the building will get this new life, this will become this new hybrid entity of mycelium in the factory. So that's in the meantime, my printer, since it's super dinky and open source, it keeps making mistakes when it's printing and also not a great coder. So it comes up with this very failed prints and failure is a big part of the work that I do and I embrace it very much. So I wanted to show this beautifully failed prints works one of a kind that were produced by the printer. So I'm actually working on a series of this and making them permanent, putting them actually into kiln. And 
Uh, microprinter in the use of hybrid matter had evolved this past fall into kind of spread into the side project and collaboration of Networker with Eric Barry Drazen. We used the slit scan images, which is right here, and then we extracted the images into the 3D and created this 3D simplified landscapes, and then we 3D printed them. Uh, again, the VRI filament was created from locally sourced materials, from clay, decayed wood, and trashed cardboard. And then we collected local reishi mushrooms and seeded these sculptures with um, uh, local reishi. Uh, and to observe how mycelium will morph the sculpture and create a new hybrid entity together with the other organism present in the substrate. So this is about 10 days of growth. As you can see, the reishi is colonizing uh, the mycelium, the sculpture slowly. So this project is kind of like, again, an ongoing part of the series. and. It's uh, in progress and I'm going to continue this in Colorado. Uh, beyond experimenting with mycelium, again, the printer and the hybrid matter is about uh, working with all the organisms. And one of the ideas is to work with algae to create a, a filament with sand and agar, with bacteria, with agar and flower, with seeds, with soil and clay. Here actually we created clay, so red clay we collected in uh, we used chia seeds as a, just a model to see how uh, the seeds will be growing on the substrate. So they was beautiful growth right here produced over the about period of 20 days. Uh, what's interesting is that the root systems were actually holding, helping to hold the sculpture together. But these are beautiful topologies that I really enjoy working with. The hybrid matter is going to its second uh, location, which is going to be Redline, Denver, where we'll be collaborating with the local greenhouse on the food security issue. And again, the microprinter will be uh, creating sculptures that are based on uh, in microscopic images of the plant cells that I'll be photographing in the greenhouse from the local produce. And so I wanted to finish this with sustainable art practices and radical care course. This is something that has been going on uh, um, that I've been working on through the whole series of my work. And so I developed this idea for, since we live in the era of climate change and everything, we continue to do business as usual. And this is, it's, you know, we're gonna reach the point of no return. And as artists, we possess powerful tools in our hands to change the world, to create a massive paradigm shift towards green cultures. And I think the shift has to start with the artists themselves by examining their practice. Through the duration of the course, I'm aiming to critically examine the work of varying artists whose practice is based on environmental art, bio art and eco art. And I want my students to learn how to spot greenwashing, not only as consumers, but as artists as well. And we will consider how art objects shape our knowledge of human history through the prism of climate change and our most immediate connection to it every day. I also want to uncover tools of multidisciplinary research based on art and science, indigenous practices and green ecologies. We will also learn how to deconstruct the artwork and reconstitute new ones based on sustainability practices. The main thing is to create system care based on biophilic hypothesis in the form of living sculpture. So I want to thank you everyone for listening. Um, this is the contact, my website, my email, and uh, my Instagram if people are interested. And I'm always open to collaborations or questions. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thanks so much. Um, we're, we'll be taking some questions at the end and now um, we'll transition to our second speaker, uh, John. Hello, thank you. Happy Arbor Day. Uh, so I thought it would be appropriate to share my screen with uh, what here is a photograph of an ancient sycamore. Uh, it's also known as Buffalo's oldest tree. It's about 300 years old and located on Franklin Street in the historic Allentown district of downtown Buffalo. Um, so we'll be presenting today uh, the images method, uh, which is a presentation based on my work in research. Um, so I ask, please excuse me in advance. Uh, this is a new presentation uh, as I may be stumbling through. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here.
All right, so again, my presentation is the plant images method, which is um, a large part of my research uh, as a, an artist and someone that's consumed with the question of landscape. And here you have an image of Les Arbes by Andre Durand, which is a painting from the early uh, 20th century. Uh, so in general, uh, the plant image as method uh, and my goal for this PowerPoint is to break down our image-based perceptions of plants and the natural environment. Um, so throughout this presentation, we'll be surveying plant representations in media uh, and some instances of popular culture. And uh, again, my intention here is to question their significant presence in our media-based expressions and to question the role and function um, of them uh, as they relate to human and plant relationships within larger contexts. Uh, so starting with an introduction, my name is John Santamary. I'm a Western New York native, which uh, I'm thankful for because it has given me the privilege of growing up in the canal city of Lockport, New York, uh, which makes me super excited uh, about a canal uh, forest restoration project. Um, while I love uh, the canal ecology I was exposed to, um, it primarily consisted of black locust trees, and I can't think of anything better than a reintroduction of white pines and white oaks to the area. Um, so if you haven't figured this out by now, I'm a plant enthusiast. Um, my academic background is actually in urban studies, uh, and through that course of um, academic survey, I really discovered that my fascination is with landscape uh, and landscape, how it ranges between both human and natural iterations. Uh, and so I chose to pursue a degree in horticulture from SUNY Niagara and have been a practicing horticulturist for about 10 years, uh, local institutions such as the botanical gardens, etc. Uh, until I finally made my way back to UB uh, and chose uh, to study bioart in the MFA and studio art program. Uh, so I thought it would make sense to just touch on what bioart is generally, or what bioart is. Um, and so uh, generally, uh, quoting Robert Mitchell, bioart uh, is uh, deals with the vitality of media, or medium, as is uh, introduced through biotechnology or bioengineering processes. Um, and ultimately, what this means is that these processes, again, bioengineering, biotechnology. Um, address uh, the living being in art forms and in, in certain respects. So again, this being Arbor Day, I'm choosing to show you Natalie German Jenko's One Trees, uh, which was an artwork from 1998 to 1999, but is ongoing. Um, this was a, a bio art uh, project in which uh, German Jenko cloned 1000 Paradox Walnuts uh, and planted them throughout San Francisco. And the goal here was to look at um, clones, uh, but the way in which environmental conditions um, affect uh, phenotypic expressions, right? Uh, so these two trees are genetically identical, but the one on the right and the one on the left uh, are responding differently to their environments. Um, and so as a horticulturist, while I'm not personally a fan of Jeremy Jaco's work, um, I'm choosing to include this artwork because uh, if any of you have hosta gardens at home, um, you'll be pleased to know that on some level you are all bio artists as hostas are propagated predominantly through tissue culture and genetic cloning. Uh, so it's super exciting. Um, I'm also choosing to show you one of my favorite bio art pieces. Uh, and this was a delphinium uh, exhibition of delphiniums at the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art in 1936. And why this is significant is because it's an early, and in my opinion, a very beautiful example of bio art. Uh, Edward Steichen is a notable uh, American photographer, um, but also a, a pretty successful gardener. And through his garden-based practice, he hybridized and created his own varieties of delphiniums. And then in 1936, filled the galleries of, of the Metropolitan Museum um, with these intensely colorful and very specifically hybridized delphinium racine, racemes as cut flowers. Um, so again, through this bioengineering process of, of constantly breeding and perfecting his perennial plants, uh, he created an early form of bio art. Um, and you know, again, as a gardener, what well, can be more beautiful than a delphinium? Um, so just a 
quick touch on my own work. Uh, I can't say I'm a bio artist. Um, what I'm really interested in, in is this relationship um, between humans and plants and the natural environment, um, but how it does address the vitality of medium in a sense of how um, we are changed by it or the plant that may be changed. Um, so here are two images from an installation from 2018 called Spectral Violet. And in this installation, I grew uh, plant-based pigments from the site, such as amaranth, uh, pokeberry, uh, also beets. And I made a pigment mixed with sourced um, minerals, and I painted the walls uh, in a corridor of the Richardson Olmsted campus, at, uh, what was Hotel Henry. And the goal here was to create um, something like a nursery for plants that they would be using, in this case, as shown, scented geraniums. And so uh, the hotel would cut these plants, use them on the tables, uh, and would also use them in their culinary processes, such as making scented geranium ice cream. Um, but what is significant about spectral violet wavelengths of light is that they increase the production of secondary metabolites. So in the case of these scented geraniums, and increase the smell of the plants. And also in, in uh, the case of the ice cream, the flavor. Um, so by painting the wall and encouraging a specific wavelength of light, um, you know, I was able to affect the production of uh, a specific quality of plant. Um, and this work was inspired by a, a um, experimental neuroquantologist who um, wrote something about how he thinks that as sentient beings, uh, we emit light at all times. Uh, and so it's kind of fascinating to think uh, that you are here in this space communicating with plants uh, through the light in which you're emitting and that light in, in itself is affecting the, the smell of the plants around you. Uh, another example of my work uh, was an installation in art uh, artwork from last year, fall 2020, called Finding Home. Um, this took place across the home grounds of Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Greycliff Estate in Derby, New York. Again, my interest here is the relationship between plant and human. And in this specific piece, I, uh, piece, I sought to um, pull apart uh, sound and visual stimuli. Um, so as a gardener, uh, and to quote Frank Cabot, a uh, famous gardener, um, the garden is, is basically a place that immerses one in the senses, and that's the true pleasure of a garden and gardening, right, is to be stimulated. So what happens when we pull apart sights and sounds and put them back together again? Um, and so in this uh, piece throughout the home grounds, I placed humans and plants together uh, in these uh, some ways simultaneous performances, although the plants were a little less um, had a little bit of a less say in it than the, the humans did, um, but essentially the humans were performing for the plants. And again, my goal here is looking at the production of secondary metabolites. So here is uh, a performance artist, Alma Peguero, and she's interacting with a cannabis plant. Um, the goal is to see what kind of terpenes are produced and then to possibly create teas uh, or something in which we can experience the plant's response to Alma's beautiful performance. Um, and throughout my research practice, I think what is really um, interesting to me about the visual art world is the idea of what story is being told by visual media. And so my recent work is, is pretty well focused on plant ethnography or uh, landscape ethnographies. Uh, this idea that can we visually, uh, in my case, visually tell the story of the plant um, by depicting it through visual mediums. Um, and so, again, I mean, why this is important is because uh, one, primary theory in regard to media is this idea of reflexivity. So as creators, uh, we impart our psychology or our own thoughts about what we're creating or maybe the subject of what we're creating um, or studying in the creation itself. And so therefore, uh, anything we, that we create visually tends to reflect our own personal bias. Uh, and as a gardener, I feel this is uh, also extends to landscape as a media as well or media. Um, and so here on the left, you have a, a photograph uh, that I took uh, of a sweet cherry tree at the Richardson Olmsted campus. And again, the, my intention here of taking this photograph was to establish a relationship between two beings, the sweet cherry tree and you as the viewer. Uh, and here on the right, you have a very botanical drawing of uh, Prunus serotina or native black cherry. And as you can tell, the orientation of this photo or, or this image is really scientific here. 
uh, an accurate description of plant morphology, uh, an accurate description of the tree's uh, form and habit, et cetera. Uh, and obviously these two images are created uh, for very different reasons that reflect the intention of their maker. And so again, thinking of Les Arts by Durand, uh, this is a, a Fauvist work, again, created at the early 20th century. And my, my question here is what may be reflected through this painting? Um, you know, are trees really red? Although yes, these may be Scots pines, but I'm not sure. Um, or is this painting choosing to reflect the very emotional, very sense-driven interpretation of landscape and environment um, and the kind of very colorful expression, uh, expressionist movements of the Fauvists? Or here, an image of uh, Versailles and France, uh, arguably one of the world's most important one, uh, one of the world's most elaborate gardens. Uh, and here you'll see the orangery uh, and a very ornate, very detailed, ornamental, highly contrived and controlled gardenscape uh, that in some ways perfectly par parallels this um, psychology of, of the aristocrats at this time period. Um, one reason why I'm so delighted to show you this image is because of its title, Tourists Strolling the Chateau de Versailles. Um, but actually, when you look at this photo, there are no tourists, right? So uh, in some sense, uh, I laugh and think, well, you know, what could be construed as human here? And ultimately, it's the potted plants, right? So possibly the plants themselves have taken on more human uh, than plant-like characteristics in this image and therefore have been titled as such. Or here, another image, uh, kind of a... a uh, unfortunately recognizable picture of a suburban style landscape uh, garden. I pulled this off of Pinterest. Uh, it was posted as a response to, um, will rubber mulch uh, prevent any weeds or prevent weeds from growing in my garden? Um, and so even by looking at the kind of sad state of the coleus, um, but also the very disparate um, kind of placements of the plants themselves in this kind of uh, expanse of, of black rubber mulch, um, it would seem that our recreations of landscape in this situation uh, is a view of landscape as something that should be sterile, or landscape, again, is something that is specifically human. Uh, and ultimately, um, this pertains to even on large scale urban environments, uh, as it relates to Olmsted uh, and Olmsted's uh, psychology of tree forms. Um, so Olmsted very specifically designed his landscapes to evoke, uh, um, again, very specific uh, responses from its participants or inhabitants, but ultimately its human viewers. So Olmsted had an entire categorization of trees. And in this image of uh, what I believe is Central Park, um, you'll see that Olmsted often uses trees that only have um, large circular forms, um, grand shade trees, et cetera, that evoke a very pastoral feeling, a very pleasing feeling to the viewer, one that invites you in and pulls you into this bucolic environment. Very rarely will you see uh, him use a single spruce, Austrian spruce tree in the middle of a planting. Often you'll see trees with a similar, very angular uh, plant habits a grouped together in a grove. Uh, and somewhat located on the peripheries of his, his large parks is a way of evoking a natural space such as a forest environment, et cetera. But again, I mean, Olmsted trees, Cornelian cherry, uh, American elm, um, ash, et cetera, these are big, grand, and circular forms. Uh, which ultimately brings us uh, to one of the biggest iconographers of plant forms, in this case of the 20th century, Andy Warhol. Um, and what is fascinating is again, that Andy Warhol creates all of these paintings that um, celebrate celebrity and, and iconographic status. And here he is in 1964, creating an, an iconography of the flower. Uh, so some people argue that these were created as a response to John F. Kennedy's assassination and therefore are a memorial representation of flower. Um, but what I find interesting is this inescapable relationship, psychological relationship between the human and the flower, as evidenced in a World Health Organization study from 2005 called Topophilia and the Quality of Life. And so out of 400 people that were surveyed, uh, what was uh, able to be concluded 
uh, was that the majority of people have synesthetic relationships to landscape, meaning that they respond most when thinking about landscape or in regard to landscape with feelings of sense or specific memories. And out of all landscape qualities, people respond most to flowers, which makes me laugh and think of an expression that I can never repeat correctly, um, but goes something like, uh, the only reason why insects and animals exist is to pollinate angiosperms. Uh, and so a possible very subversive cause uh, for the human psychology or, uh, or psychological relationship with the flower. Uh, and again, thinking of uh, the realm of horticulture therapy and what may be concluded uh, in terms of uh, human responses to nature or nature-based images uh, is a study in 2015, uh, which follows up previous studies that conclude that as human beings, we respond to plant-based images. What is really fascinating about this specific study, at least to me, is that it, it argues that not only do we respond to plant-based images uh, with conditions of wellness or some kind of quantifiable, improved uh, betterment, but we respond most to natural images of wellness and not artificial images of wellness which is fascinating. It's like, you can't, you can't fool your body here. Um, your body wants to be dealing with the real thing here. Uh, and horticulture therapy in general kind of crosses uh, a wide range of physical and psychological responses to the plant-based environment. Thinking of immersive-based practices or responses to soil microbacteria, et cetera. And so here is an image from Valentine Flats, uh, Walnut Grove, uh, which is arguably one of the most beautiful immersive spaces in Western New York. So I asked the question then, what is the significance of the plant-based image and why is, does it seem that we are inseparable uh, from plants or uh, natural uh, images in our visual culture? Uh, and thinking of contemporary art across the board, artists such as Ai Weiwei, uh, who's creating uh, large, large sculptures such as Tree. Uh, this is one from his Tree series at the National Gallery of Canada from 2009, 2010. And in this series, Ai Weiwei went across his homeland in uh, Northern China and um, harvested bits and pieces of trees of various species and, and then brought them to uh, various galleries in the world and reconstructed trees out of their parts, uh, which is kind of a fascinating way of questioning our reconstruction of landscape after the devastation we've, we've wrought upon it. Um, thinking here of a recent exhibition from last October in London uh, at the Hayward Gallery called Among the Trees, in which uh, several artists, uh, at least a dozen artists were curated and their works were shown that expressed um, not only the relationship between the human and tree, um, but also what is emerging as um, evidence of plant uh, cognition um, and the ways in which uh, we are interrelating with our environment um, through uh, realms and means of intercommunication, um, but also noting how plants themselves intercommunicate within environments. Uh, so as we um, are kind of looking at art as a representation of new ways of understanding our natural landscapes. And I couldn't talk about plants and art uh, in contemporary art without referencing Rashid Johnson. Um, here shown untitled Bronze Hen Head, not his most famous work, uh, but one I simply love uh, being a tropical plants guy. Um, Rashid Johnson uses plants uh, in, in representational forms in his artwork to talk about uh, colonial practices and post-colonialism. Uh, he is an African-American artist and um, kind of shares experiences with plant, uh, the plant world and plant-based systems in which um, these colonial uh, infrastructures have kind of wrought uh, devastating effects on plants and have since commodified them and spread them across the globe in, in, in certain ways. Um, and again, here is this bronze head. Um, and more contemporary visual art uh, in, in the form of painting. Uh, here's a detail of Jonas Wood's uh, Jungle Kitchen. Uh, Jonas Wood often depicts images of house plants, uh, and in this case, an interior landscape in which he's covered with the forms of tropical house plants uh, as a way of conflating both the interior environment and the exterior environment in a very contemporary, very real, and very popular way. Has anybody heard of Monstera Mondays? Is anybody on social media? 
So this is a very popular plant uh, hashtag, right? So plants have millions of hashtags and posts on social media. One of the most popular being Monstera Mondays, one of the most popular plants being Monstera Deliciosa. Uh, this is a, a tropical, very expressive plant in my opinion. And here you'll see it uh, uh, pinned on Pinterest with the hashtag Monstera Mondays. And here you see it um, depicted in Matisse's, um, well, I can't think of the French name, um, but essentially the musicians uh, as the backdrop, right? Is so in some ways, the popularity of the house plant as it's deriving uh, a new interior escape uh, throughout the latter part of the 20th century and early on into the 21st century. Uh, and so the question being, um, you know, why is the, the house plant so popular? Why is it dominating our social media escapes? Uh, why is it dominating uh, prevalent uh, contemporary art forms? Uh, so to quote Tim Richardson uh, from the film, The Gardener, which is a 2016 documentary on Frank Cabot in like Hetrovan Gardens in, in uh, Northern Canada. He's, he argues that artists are using plant forms predominantly because uh, the most urgent aspect of the human experience of the, at this moment is the landscape as it relates to issues of global warming. Uh, questioning how we can derive a more sustainable relationship with landscape. And that's his explanation for why plants are everywhere these days. But possibly if you were a cultural anthropologist or a theorist, you could make um, some other assumptions. Um, so here uh, I'm referencing Lisa Stevenson, who is a medical anthropologist. Uh, her work introduces the idea of the images method which was popular by uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss as a, um, in the power of belief. And so in this work, which imagines care in the Canadian Arctic, uh, Lisa Stevenson uh, looks at practices of indigenous care uh, and the role of the image uh, and the photograph specifically, and how oftentimes symbols and images um, are really um, important in how we are construing uh, these issues of health and wellness, but specifically healing uh, in these uh, very specific circumstances. Um, this idea that cultural images are very important to translating cultural ideals and cultural knowledge. Or in the case of Roland Bart, a theorist, um, and his book, Camera Lucida, um, the relevance of the, the photographic image, not only for memory, uh, but as he cites, uh, in his case, what he calls punctum, the way the image in, in, in his work, the photograph relates to the human body specifically. Um, so questioning both of, of these theorists, you know, are we referencing plant images uh, for means of cultural healing and therapy, or maybe we are referencing images of plants for the physical relationship that they derive as we look at them. And so I'm going to end uh, as I began with uh, the same uh, slide. The only difference is I'm putting a question mark here, uh, the plant images method and ask you to, to make your own determinations. Uh, with this information as to why we seem to be seeing so many plants, uh, not only in, in our landscapes, but also in our visual media. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for your time today and the opportunity to present and celebrate Arbor Day with you. Thanks so much. Uh... John and Daria, um, are there any questions for either of our presenters? I guess I have um, I have a question for John, um, maybe kind of a comment slash question. I was reading recently how gardening has really exploded during the pandemic um, and that, you know, even even non-traditional demographics have like really taken to gardening. Um, like, I, you know, would you say like within the past year, year and a half? Have you noticed any kind of uptick in um, people gravitating toward plants? 
Yeah, it's actually really interesting. So last May uh, in 2020 COVID year, uh, the home improvement sector of the economy increased by almost $4 billion, uh, which is just incredible. Um, not only that, but as someone that works in horticulture, it was impossible to find annual bedding plants anywhere because they were being shipped to places like New York City for like, exorbitant amounts of money at auction. Um, and so I think it's interesting as we think about, again, about um, these interrelationships of landscape um, and uh, anthropologist, um, uh, unfortunately, I just blanked on his name, um, but some anth anthropological theory that talks about home is this ability to create an environment and uh, home is this response to working on a specific place, right? Um, so thinking about our need to be home during a pandemic and the need to feel safe uh, within our homes, uh, it, it almost seems inseparable then to think about home as a place that we're not necessarily working in, whether that be in the gardenscape or as so many other people have turned toward home improvements in general. Um, and I, I can only assume that going forward and looking at uh, research and studies on the pandemic, we'll see e even more elaborate uh, interrelationships in that respect. Thanks. Um, someone might have had a, a hand up at some point. If, if that was you, feel free to add your question to the chat or just unmute yourself and, and ask. I, I, I know both these artists work, so it's it's maybe more of a less of a question. Well, just a way of getting them to talk about it. But um, what what do you think about? I mean, as Daria, when you talk about like kind of idea of like the aesthetics of care, like what is the relationship between like things that are beautiful and the things that we care to keep alive, or the relationship between making something making something pleasing? and making people be able to, to care about preserving it, um, trying to connect to this, maybe other themes that have probably come up in Arbor Day, like, you know, uh, how, does, how does what we save have to do with what humans find beautiful? Daria, I think you're- Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm saying it's interesting. I'm kind of working in the opposite direction of aesthetics of care that it's not beautiful and more like on the opposite spectrum, like ugly, you know? So, but yeah, of course. And I think it's, I mean, I'm not an expert, but from so far, so what I was reading, um, I mean, it's. I think it's like evolutionary that we are drawn to something, you know, to beautiful things and we like kind of wired. And that's why, you know, like the studies about the, um, all the baby animals, they look very adorable. So our brain is immediately drawn to them. So what's interesting about this ideas of um, care for all matter, it's what James uh, basically Bennett is talking about is how things uh, morph into another. And at some point there is basically very hard to tell the distinction between what was there before and that what was became after. And I think, um, we as, um, like we care like in aesthetics and beautiful, and that goes also to John's uh, research on like these beautiful gardens and horticulture, right? So we're more, look, we're more pleasing to look at something that is polished and potentially uh, beautiful because of the cultural connotations under that or like conditioning to that for a while. And so now it's almost like, can we care about something that is not polished and that's not beautiful and it's not necessarily, con we are conditioned. It's almost like you have to sort of like, I don't know even how to explain it, but like decolonize your brain in the sense, right? To be able to or think outside the box or feel outside of the box. You know, it's not even like thinking, but feeling outside of the box. Like I am absolutely terrified of caterpillars. I find them absolutely, ugly and I had really bad experience when I was growing like a little kid 
and yet I've noticed, so once I was at the class and somebody was growing the tons of silkworms for the project and I just walked into the lab and they were right there in front of me. And there was the amount of overwhelming of them so many that it totally numbed my brain. And then I told myself, look, I don't like what this thing, like they make me feel really creepy. So I started looking at them. And then I found like this interesting beauty in their movements. And so that was like a moment of me having the conscious decision of, uh, you know, being passing a, away from the ideas and this concepts that I've developed or, you know, like maybe it was conditioned or like experience. And then after a while, I was just, you know, I'm still not a huge fan, but I don't like close my eyes when I see caterpillars or run away and I sort of stop and, and there was a big improvement. I picked one up and I petted it and it was great. And I was like, oh, I care about you little ugly thing, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, it's, I think it's, uh, again, so just don't be repetitive, but it's almost like I wanted to uh, learn how to, or maybe, maybe we should learn, like how we learn how to feel outside of the box and how to care for how not to prioritize for what we want to care based on aesthetics, you know? And I think nowadays um, with this huge um, kind of like blast and acceptance of minorities of people who don't not, who not necessarily were uh, fit in the traditional, um, uh, you know, like, per, like traditional norms. So that opens up more possibilities of feeling for something that is, not necessarily pleasing, you know. So I hope I answered the question. I'm kind of working in the, again, I'm working in the opposite direction of that. I'm trying to like, okay, I mean, I had like very ugly hairless cats and I thought they were the most beautiful creatures in the world. I think that's kind of interesting because it almost speaks that like what you care about could become beautiful to you yes. or what is beautiful you could care about. Um, exactly. Yeah. And that's, it's almost like if we collectively uh, start caring about, you know, I don't know, st stop creating hierarchy in our care system. So that could be a breaking point in terms of, you know, uh, we want this beautiful, we want, we like beautiful woods, but if we destroy some kind of a landscape, we just like, oh, we don't want to, like, you know, like we are restoring it, but what if we can't restore it? What can we do with it so we can care about it, you know? So um, that's something that I'm thinking a lot. So thank you. Do we have any, uh, any last questions for our speakers? Or, or maybe I think one just popped up. We'll have to, we have a couple minutes left only, but let's see, I think there is a question here. Um, this is for Daria, I think. Did you find that particular substrates allowed for certain fruiting bodies to appear on a more consistent basis? Were there any types of mushrooms you could not produce? I actually don't know. I can only know the mushrooms that I can produce because I work with a very limited amount. It's kind of like, it's hard to get them uh, it's a tricky thing, like get the harvest in the wild, wild and then not them, you know, like propagate them. It's a little bit tricky, but well, it's uh, the substrate particularly allowed for certain fruiting bodies and more consistent. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the bio. It's basically what they like. Like if I um, have more specific nutrients, obviously the, the mycelium, the fruiting bodies will emerge, but it also depends on the other factors like humidity and temperature, right? So this is all like kind of like biology uh, related stuff, but also my goal is necessarily to let the organisms uh, do what they want to do. So I, that's why I, I sense in a way, the collaborative process for me is not um, basically steering them in the way I want them to work. You know, I'm just giving them the, sh the, the, the food to colonize, right, to eat, but in a way to see what's going to happen uh, when you know they colonize specific substrates so but this is something um you know like it's tons of research done in terms of which uh nutrients are producing specific like the lack of oxygen is going to deform 
the mushrooms look very deformed where there is no oxygen involved or lack of light, for example, when they're in that stage. And that's, there are artists who already worked with it. For example, I think uh, there was an artist who actually uh, grew mushrooms specifically towards the light. And then they, it kept turning the sculpture and the mushrooms had created, there were ratio mushrooms that had created this like geometrical forms, right? So that's like one of the interesting uh, examples of manipulating the final, the outcome of the fruit and bodies. Um, okay, yeah, so. And there is tons of mushrooms I'm sure I cannot grow yet, yet, but <laughs> you're welcome. Well, thank you both very, very much for joining us and uh, helping us celebrate Arbor Day and just bring more awareness to plants, fungi, sustainable practices, and uh, and all, all of these areas and art in the interaction with art biology. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much.